Four centuries ago, the lakes and rivers were quiet. Wild things peopled the forests. Beaver, which the Indians called Amek, lived by the shores. Indians roamed 5,000 miles of wilderness. The waterways were their paths. White men came in ships from Europe. They came to explore, they came as missionaries, they came to trade. To the north and the west lay the fur land. <laughs> In winter, the coat of the beaver was thicker, so the Indian trapped in the snow. He built a lean-to of evergreen brush and gathered wood for a fire. He set his traps. He made the tour of his trap line on snowshoes, which the Algonquins called Akimak. They were made from strips of ashwood bent to shape and laced with caribou thongs. In a likely place for beaver, he would set a deadfall. The bait was hidden by evergreen brush, and the simple trap was only two heavy logs, balanced on blocks of wood, with a stick which held the bait wedged between them. When the prey tugged at the bait, the heaviest log would slip down, pinning him to the spot. <laughs> A beaver would buy him two hatchets. For ten winter beaver, he would get a new muzzle-loading gun. The beaver was the standard of trade. For three white winter ermine, he would receive the value of one beaver. Furs for the courts of Europe and Asia meant gold for the merchants of Montreal and for the hardy Indian trapper, powder and balls and good black tobacco, moist and hard twisted. The cleaned and dried skins were tightly bound to his wooden sled or toboggan and hauled away from the camp. <laughs> There were many frozen streams in the beaver country and the trapper often used them as paths. Sometimes he had to clear his pathway. As spring drew near, he tested the ice under the snow before he pushed his sled across the stream. Spring comes with a rush in the Northland. Minogami, the Indians call it, when the sun is warm and the streams begin to sing again. The trapper hurried to reach the post before the trails were soft. At the Hudson's Bay outpost, they traded their furs with the white men, but the pelts were still 2,000 miles from the ships that would carry them over the sea. 
there were rivers that ran to the ports and daring canoe men carried the cargoes down. The Indians built their canoes from things of the forest. They built them of bark from the trees. Birch bark was strong and had natural gum that preserved it for long. In the eastern forests were many giant birches. They slit the bark down with a crooked knife, one in trade from the white men, whom they called Jean de Fer, people of iron. They pried it loose with a wedge of bark. This they did in June, when the sap was running and the bark was moist and loose on the tree. They called the bark wigwas. The craft has been handed down to the sons of Matt Bernard, an Algonquin chief who still knows the secret of building as the ancient Indians built. At their camp, Matt and Morris, his son, unrolled the bark, softening it with hot water poured from an iron pot. Such pots could be had from the traders at one beaver skin per pound of pot. Then Matt splits the sweet-smelling kijik, or cedar, to make a lining. He lays the strips of cedar on the bark to protect it during the building. The frame is made by tying together at each end two long strips of pliable wood, such as cedar or ash. They are tightly bound with thongs of peeled basswood bark. Cross pieces are fitted and tied into place. They lay this frame on the bark and anchor it in place with heavy stones. Then the canoe begins to take shape. They fold the ends up and hold them by a simple vise. They drive in stakes to hold the bark in shape. As they turn up the bark, they pour on hot water to keep it from splitting. A second strip of bark is slipped in to form the side of the craft. And then comes the longest task of all, a task that falls to the women the sewing of seams in the bark. The sewing is done with wattop, the stubborn spruce root pulled from the ground by the men. The tough fiber is carefully split. Matt follows the grain from side to side, making sure the division is even. Morris peels off the rough outer bark. After soaking in water, the wattab is moist and soft for use. Holes are punched with a megus, or bone awl. Matt's wife is Algonquin. She learned the skills of her grandparents, who were Indians of the woods. With them she lived in and from the forest. All the women work at the sewing, for the seams are long. While the women sew, the men go on with the building. A piece of cedar is split into many prongs and bent to form the bow piece. Matt binds it with basswood bark and ties it in such a way that it holds its curve.
Then he trims the bark at the prow. He does not leave it high enough to catch the wind and thus makes steering difficult. He cuts it to a curve that will skim the water easily. A gunnel is made to fit the canoe and fastened on with wooden pegs. Spruce root is used again as a binding. The gunnel must be strong and the binding firm, for a half dozen voyageurs will entrust their lives to the hands that built the canoe. Meanwhile, Strips of cedar for the ribs have been put to soak in the river. The wet cedar is easily bent. Each one is fitted to its own place in the body of the canoe. In this shape they dry, and Matt whittles the ends to fit in under the gunwale. Out in the woods again, the women gather Minai Gobigyu, the thick gum that hardens in great drops on the trunk of the spruce tree. This will be used to make the seams watertight. First, the lumps of raw gum are placed in a bag and boiled in water. The bits of bark and dirt that cling to the gum are held in the bag, but the clear gum rises to the surface and is skimmed off with a birch bark spoon. The hot liquid gum is dropped into cold water and hardens immediately so that it can be pulled until every drop of water is gone and it turns to the color of wild honey. Again it is boiled over the fire and this time tallow is added. It must be exactly the right amount to make the gum soft enough not to crack in the cold water and yet hard enough not to melt in the hot sun. At last the gum is ready for use and the seams are caulked on the inside with a simple brush made from the splayed end of an ashwood stick. The gum hardens on the seams, sealing the holes against the swift water. They line the canoe with cedar. It must be strong to keep the two tons of freight and the straining feet of the paddlers from pressing too hard against the bark and the root sewn seams. They drive the ribs home with a hammer made from a heavy crooked knot. Soon the canoe will be ready for launching. But first, it must be caulked on the outside. Matt and his wife hand down to the new generation the skill of their hands and the lore of the woods. Here is a strong and graceful canoe built from things of the forest. Bark of the silver birch, sweet-scented cedar wood, stripped bark of the basswood tree, spruce gum and ash wood, spruce root from the earth, tallow from animals caught in the hunt. All these put together by Indian craftsmen to build a canoe that is native to Canada's rivers. The voyageurs paddle these canoes, the charge, as they call the big freight canoes. These were the first Canadians. They opened the wilderness, exploring the unknown waters, pushing ahead of the pioneers who settled along the shore.
the foremost paddler watched for danger ahead. They landed to carry the canoe and its cargo beyond the falls. They call this carrying portage. The paddles were tied into place with deer thongs and the canoe was hoisted onto the shoulders of the men who paddled fore and aft. The other canoe men followed, toting the bales on tump lines, leather straps that were tied round the bales and fitted over the forehead. The standard weight for each bundle was 90 pounds, but sometimes the voyageur carried as much as 300 pounds. Between the post of Michin Mackinac on Lake Huron and Montreal, there were 35 portages, sometimes as much as a league in length. <laughs> Et la petite passe par le devant, pique en pas, c'est l'amour qui la prend. Et la petite passe par le devant, les autres par derrière, les autres par derrière, les autres par derrière. N'avez-vous pas vu mon amant, pique en pas, c'est l'amour qui la prend. N'avez-vous pas vu mon amant. The river trails led them sometimes down one river and up another to reach the St. Lawrence waterway. Rivers that still bear Indian names. Nittigon, Ottawa, Matawaska. They came to know the rivers. They heard the roar of the white water ahead of them, and they gave us place names like Petwewe, I hear it coming, which we call Petewawa. On the Ottawa, one of the greatest of all the trade rivers, was the thundering Swishaw Rapids. They landed and hoisted the bales on tump lines. They called this a décharge. With a lightened canoe riding high on the water, they dare to shoot the rapids. In August, the voyageurs reached Montreal, where they met the trading ships from Europe. They unloaded their furs and picked up winter supplies. Soon, autumn frosts touched the woods of the Northland. The voyageurs hurried back to reach their distant camps before the winter was on them. They portaged the supplies. They paddled swiftly up the shallow autumn rivers. They crossed the windswept lakes, sometimes traveling 20 hours a day, these voyageurs, who lived hard and hungry to follow the paths of the rivers and open a new land. Moi 